the combination of GOP-backed proposals to raise the fees that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac charge mortgage lenders. As well as Washington the Journal airs every morning live at 7 a.m. Eastern. Going live to the House now, debate on non-controversial bills under suspension of the rules happening now. Provider may obtain a consumer's informed written consent on an ongoing basis, and that consent may be obtained through the internet as amended. The clerk will report the title of the bill. Union Calendar Number 211, H.R. 2471, a bill to amend Section 2710 of Title 18, United States Code, to clarify that a videotape service provider may obtain a consumer's informed written consent on an ongoing basis, and that consent may be obtained through the internet. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Goodlatte, and the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers, each will control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Virginia. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days within which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous materials on H.R. 2471 as amended. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, today I am pleased that we are considering a bipartisan bill to update the Video Privacy Protection Act of 1998. This bill will ensure that a law related to the handling of videotape rental information is updated to reflect the realities of the 21st century. The VPPA was passed by Congress in the wake of Judge Robert Bork's 1987 Supreme Court nomination battle during which a local Washington, D.C. newspaper obtained a list of videotapes the Bork family rented from its neighborhood videotape rental store. This disclosure caused bipartisan outrage, which resulted in the enactment of the VPPA. The commercial video distribution landscape has changed dramatically since 1988. Back then, the primary consumer consumption of commercial video content occurred through the sale or rental of pre-recorded video cassette tapes. This required users to travel to their local video rental store to pick a movie. Afterward, consumers had to travel back to the store to return the rented movie. Movies that consumers rented and enjoyed were recommended to friends primarily through face-to-face -face conversations. With today's technology, consumers can quickly and efficiently access video programming through a variety of platforms, including through Internet Protocol-based video services, all without leaving their homes. This bill updates the VPPA to allow videotape service providers to facilitate the sharing on social media networks of the movies watched or recommended by users. Specifically, it is narrowly crafted to preserve the VPPA's protections for consumers' privacy while modernizing the law to empower consumers to do more with their video consumption preferences, including sharing names of new or favorite TV shows or movies on social media in a simple way. However, it protects the consumer's control over the information by requiring consumer consent before any of this occurs, and it makes clear that a consumer can opt in to the ongoing sharing of his or her favorite movies or TV shows without having to provide consent each and every time a movie is rented. It also makes clear that written affirmative consent can be provided through the Internet and can be withdrawn at any time. Finally, thanks to an amendment from the gentleman from New York, the ranking member of the Constitution Subcommittee, Mr. Nadler, the amended bill we are considering today requires that the consent be distinct and separate from any other form setting forth other legal and financial obligations. This bill is truly pro-consumer and places the decision of whether or not to share video rentals with one's friends squarely in the hands of the consumer. In fact, the co-chairs of the Future of Privacy Forum correctly pointed out in an opinion piece in Roll Call on November 29th that the antiquated law on the books is a hindrance to consumers. This legislation does not change the scope of who is covered by the VPPA or the definition of personally identifiable information. In addition, it preserves the requirement that the user provide affirmative written consent. It is time that Congress updates the VPPA to keep up with today's technology and the consumer marketplace. This bill does just that, and I hope my colleagues will join me in supporting this important piece of bipartisan legislation. I reserve the balance of my time. Virginia reserves its time. The gentleman from Michigan. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I 
would uh, yield myself as much time as I may consume. The recognized. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I, I thank the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Goodlatte, for his uh, excellent presentation. I uh, agree with him that what probably triggered this bill in uh, 1988 was uh, Supreme Court nominee Robert Burke's video rental history in which his privacy was violated uh, in a very major way. And so I join him and uh, the members of the House Judiciary Committee in supporting the Video Piracy Protection Act, which provides continued consumer protection. H.R. 2471 is uh, very important in this respect because over the course of the 23 years that uh, this measure has become law, there have been significant changes in the ways and the means by which people view uh, technological content. Uh, movies can now be downloaded to mobile phones. Live events can be streamed in real time to laptops using mobile ser internet services. Uh, and so there were so many other things happening in the uh, transformations that go on at all times that would have, that could not have been contemplated in 1988. So there, there was ambiguity about whether the statute applies only to physical goods such as video cassettes and DVDs. Under this bill, a videotape service provider means anybody engaged in business in or affecting interstate or foreign commerce of rental sale or delivery or pre-recorded video cassette tapes or similar audio-visual materials. Uh, it's the phrase similar audio-visual materials that have created some ambiguity. And so uh, what we've done is written, cons uh, is specifying the requirement of informed written consent for disclosure uh, may include consent through electronic means using the internet. And so uh, as the bill moved through committee markup, I, I wanted to make sure the bill provides for the greatest protection for consumer privacy. And accordingly, uh, like the uh, subcommittee chair, I supported the Nadler amendments that required such cons consent re requests be clearly and prom prominently presented to the consumer. Fortunately, uh, those uh, amendments were accepted. And though uh, I feel that the bill could have gone further, I believe, for, examine, uh, for example, that the consumer should be asked periodically if their consent should uh, be renewed. Uh, it, it is a good bill, and accordingly, I join in uh, supporting its passage, and I reserve the balance the of my time. The gentleman from Michigan reserves his time. The gentleman from Virginia. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the gentleman from Michigan, the distinguished ranking member of the committee, for his support for the legislation uh, and reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Michigan. I'm pleased to yield now to the gentleman from North Carolina, my friend Mel Watt of the Judiciary Committee. I think he's the ranking subcommittee member of, of this uh, part of the Judiciary Committee. I yield to him as much time as he may consume. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the gentleman uh, from Michigan for yielding time. Um, and I regret that I have to be the skunk at the party today uh, in opposition to uh, this bill. Um, 
while I support innovation on the web, I do not support it at the expense of consumer privacy. I believe we've rushed this bill to the floor without sufficient development and consequently without giving any thought to its implications for consumer privacy. Uh, the bill would amend what is widely considered to be one of the strongest protections of consumer privacy records in the United States, the Video Privacy Protection Act, without receiving testimony from a single privacy expert. It also ignores the impact this bill may have on state laws providing similar or greater protections at a time when we know that uh, technology has become almost commonplace that's pervasive and invasive, our responsibility as policymakers is not to surrender to technology and to sacrifice the values of, uh, that we have held dear since the founding of this nation. Technology and privacy are not incompatible. We can and should promote technological innovation while simultaneously preventing the unwarranted, uninformed dissemination of personal information. This bill falls short of that objective. The supporters of this bill point to the widespread sharing already taking place over the Internet, but they neglect to publicize the privacy lawsuits, uh, some of which are still pending against those video and music sites that permit their users to share their playlist. The Video Privacy Protection Act was not only a reaction to the publication of Judge Robert Bork's rental records during his nomination proceeding to, uh, to the United States Supreme Court. The committee report also noted where an attorney obtained video records in a custody dispute to demonstrate that the father was unfit to have custody of his children based largely on his video rental records. Many of the lawsuits today reflect consumer concerns with precisely this type of abuse and misuse of rental records and other equally private information. Stated purpose of the bill is to respond to the new commercial video distribution landscape by empowering consumers to do more with their video consumption preferences including sharing names of new or favorite TV shows or movies on social media in a simple way. But when you really peel away the layers, you have to ask yourself one question. Who does this bill benefit? It really doesn't benefit the consumer. The consumer already has the capacity to share his or her video preferences online however she pleases. The bill instead benefits companies by relieving them of the burden of protecting consumer records by getting a one-time, one-time universal consent to disclose users' viewing history in order to share them on social, social media sites. But because social media site, sites are often dynamic with users' rosters of friends ever-changing, a consumer's consent today to allow access to their viewing history is clearly not informed by who will be their friend tomorrow. Today, when online bullying of teens or young adults is increasing and leading to depression or suicide, we should have greater care to ensure that their interests are not cavalierly disregarded allowing video service providers to release information as private as a person's viewing history, which clearly shows to the world their loves, likes, and dislikes should not be done without careful contemplation and consideration. In closing, I would just emphasize that I believe that technological advance and innovation is extreme, are both extremely important. It is the future of America's economy. I don't question that. However, allowing the release of truly private consumer information in the name of innovation without careful consideration is reckless on our part. And I urge my colleagues to vote no on this legislation 
and I thank the gentleman for yielding time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Virginia. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as may consume uh, to respond to my good friend from North Carolina. And he and I have uh, attempted to work together to resolve his differences. And in fact, I believe that the amendment offered by the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler, uh, does resolve some of the concerns the gentleman had, but obviously, uh, as he has just expressed, not all of them. So I'd like to respond to what he has indicated. Content providers, the Internet community, and consumer advocacy groups support the bipartisan effort to enact a common-sense modernization of the Video Privacy Protection Act. Hulu, Google, Facebook, IAC, Apple, the Center for Democracy and Technology, and the Future of Privacy Forum are among those who see H.R. 2471 for the simple modernizing amendment that it is. The VPPA contains a strict standard of privacy, opt-in consent. The proposed amendment to the VPPA, H.R. 2471, keeps the opt-in standard fully intact. H.R. 2471 enhances the protection in pro provided by the VPPA by ensuring that the opt-in consent required must be separate and distinct from any other end-user agreement. This measure further empowers consumers to make decisions about their information in a manner that is fully informed. None of the uh, examples provided by Mr. Watt illustrate a disagreement between the commenters he highlighted with the consumer empowerment measures that H.R. 2471 provides. H.R. 2471 simply gives consumers the freedom to share what they've watched with their friends if they would like to. It grants consumers the same right to share movies and television shows that they've enjoyed as is already possible for music, news, and books. And he correctly notes that someone can right now go on Facebook or some other social media and say, I watched this movie or that television show and I like it or don't like it. The, the difference, however, is that consumers do not understand why they can have an arrangement for the music they listen to to immediately go up online so that their friends can listen to the same music simultaneously. But with regard to uh, movies, they have to take additional steps that can, under circumstances, be inconvenient to them. And that's why they like this convenience, and that's why consumers should have it. And that's why this bill empowers consumers in ways that they are not empowered today and why it is a real consumer bill. H.R. 2471 ensures that the VPPA's high standard of privacy protection remains untouched. Consumers must affirmatively opt in to share with friends the movies and television shows they've watched. A consumer can withdraw his or her consent at any time, and H.R. 2471 is narrowly tailored to update the VPPA, a 1980s law, to make it compatible with consumers' desires, with consumers' communications, with consumers' social, socializing on the Internet in the 21st century. And the committee has indicated in its report language that there is no intention for this clarification to negate in any way existing laws, regulations, and practices designed to protect the, the privacy of children on the Internet. As always, however, the first line of defense to protecting a child's privacy while online is the parents. Social networking websites allow users to share personal information about themselves with their friends. But used inappropriately, personal information can be shared beyond a user's friends. Just as parents are responsible for teaching their children not to talk to strangers, the committee expects parents to play an active role in ensuring their children's proper use of social networking or any other websites on the Internet. This legislation in no way changes the privacy protection for children on the Internet uh, and uh, that law as the VPA PPA itself with regard to its privacy protections and its opt-in requirement are not changed. This is simply a modern way for people to be able to communicate with uh, their friends in ways that are convenient to them and that they already use and do not understand why if they can use it with music, with news, with books, with other forms of uh, communication and speech that they can't do it with regard to their movie and television shows. I reserve the balance of my time. Mr. Speaker, Virginia reserves I, I yield from my colleague from North Carolina 
as much time as he may consume. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the gentleman for yielding once again. And in response to my colleague from Virginia, Mr. Goodlatte, we have, in fact, uh, been trying to work out our differences. Uh, the problem is that his um, definition of, um, of protecting privacy is not as extensive as my definition of protecting privacy. And um, I think my definition of protecting privacy is more consistent with consumers because consumers keep filing these lawsuits um, to try to, um, to protect themselves from the, uh, from the disclosure of their personal information. Uh, the Electronic Privacy Information Center uh, which has been at the forefront of ensuring privacy productions, uh, protections for consumers in the information age, uh, just last week secured a victory for Facebook users uh, when its complaint to the Federal Trade Commission resulted in a settlement requiring Facebook to establish an extensive privacy program. Um, analy analytics company uh, and web video Hulacom have been hit with another privacy lawsuit over their alleged um, use of uh, super cookies to track people. There, there are, there's case after case after case of consumers' information being used, abused, misused, and here we are making it easier for that to occur by saying, you can give one time, they already have the authority to release the, the, the information when they download a movie now. But this will give one time universal coverage to release everything that I view on video. And that's inconsistent with what I think is necessary to protect the privacy of people in this electronic age. Now, I understand that there are people who have an interest in, um, in this. I mean, there are people who profit from mining this kind of information. Uh, but our interest should be in protecting the, the, the rights of consumers, protecting them from having this kind of private information. I would think since the original Video Protection Act was about protecting the privacy of Judge Robert Bork and reviewing uh, and, and people uh, going into his records to review his video viewing privacy, that my colleagues on the opposite side of the, hall, of the aisle would be the most vigorous in trying to protect uh, uh, this. But here we are giving in to uh, the, the interest that will make money out of this and exposing our children and our own viewing habits uh, to this kind of um, intrusive um, uh, action on, on our part. I don't, and, and we are doing it without the benefit of any testimony at a hearing to talk about this. Um, we should simply not be doing this. Um, I want to uh, submit, we're in the House, so I'll submit for the record a letter dated December 5, 2012. Uh, I ask unanimous consent to submit for the record. Without objection. Uh, a letter dated uh, December 5, uh, 2012 um, from the um, Electronic Privacy Information Center. Um, in which they aggressively oppose this legislation. Uh, they say they are a nonpartisan public interest research organization. Um, um, the Video Protection, Privacy Protection Act was passed in 1988 following disclosure of private uh, video rental records of Supreme Court nominee uh, by a video rental store to a news organization. There are broad-based support for passage of the act. There was broad-based support for passage of the act, and it was signed by President Ronald Reagan. Um, and uh, this act was considered a model privacy act uh, in many respects. It's technology neutral, 
And this bill undermines this uh, Video Privacy Act um, that was the model act that was designed to protect a Republican nominee to the Supreme Court and was signed into law by a Republican president. And here we are in this Congress getting ready to send the bill over to the Senate, which hopefully they won't act on. They will save us from our own um, ineptitude, uh, which would undermine the key provision of the uh, Video Protection Act, uh, which is the right of users to give meaningful consent to the disclosure of their personal information. This blanket consent according to the Electronic Privacy Information Center, and I agree with them wholeheartedly, um, uh, the blanket consent provisions transfer control from the individual user to the company in possession of the data and diminish the control that Netflix customers would have in the use and disclosure of their personal information. While we recognize that other companies routinely report on the activities of their customers. We note that Facebook users have never been particularly happy about this. The history of Beacon is well known and also that the routine disclosure of video viewing activities is not something that most Facebook users are clamoring for. In fact, Facebook, just as we uh, just indicated, just entered into a settlement of a privacy lawsuit. And here we are on the floor of the House saying that we value that, um, the business interest, more than we value the personal privacy interest of, uh, of individual citizens. This is a bad idea. It shouldn't be here on the suspension calendar as if it's a non-controversial clarification of the law, this is a dramatic undermining of the, um, of the Video Protection, uh, Privacy Protection Act. We are doing disservice to our constituents by giving this authority. They already have the authority to do it on a case-by-case-by-case -by -case -by -case basis. It may be inconvenient to the companies to get the authority given to them that way, but that's the way it should be given to them, not in some blanket authority that just allows the companies to go in and use this information as uh, willy-nilly and without regard to the privacy. I thank the gentleman for yielding again, and I may ask him to yield again depending on what happens, but uh, um, uh, for, oh, he says he's not going to yield to me anymore. I just think my, my, uh, my colleagues should vote against this bill, um, defeat it on suspension, let's at least he, debate he it in talk. under regular order on the floor of the House Thank or send it God. back to the committee so we can have some hearings about the privacy implications so we can get this done. And I appreciate the gentleman for yielding and yield back to him. The gentleman yields Thank back you. the gentleman from Virginia. Mr. Speaker, in no way does this uh, legislation in any way undercut the principal purpose of the Video Protection Privacy Act, Privacy Protection Act, because the power rests with the consumer. Basically what this legislation does is it empowers consumers to do things in the 21st century with regard to their movie and, and uh, television viewing uh, communications with their friends that they already have with music, they already have with news, they already have with books or magazine articles that they read and uh, we should have that kind of consistency in the law. The Video Protection Privacy Act uh, remain strong and its principal purposes remain there intact and it is an opt-in requirement, an opt-in requirement that uh, uh, anyone who wants to avail themselves of this convenience uh, has to give uh, informed consent to do so and I urge my colleagues to support this very bipartisan legislation has strong support on both sides of the aisle and uh, I am uh, uh, prepared to yield back. I'll uh, Does the gentleman, the, uh, gentleman from Michigan time? if he has further speakers? Does the gentleman from Virginia reserve his time? I will reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Michigan has two minutes remaining. The gentleman's recognized. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to yield the remainder of our time 
to uh, a distinguished magistrate from Georgia, now a member of the Judiciary Committee, the balance of our time. The gentleman is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Ranking Man Member. Mr. Speaker, uh, I rise today uh, in opposition to passage of uh, H.R. 2471. You know, this bill will make it easy for uh, video producers to be able to sell to others information that consumers uh, may feel like it's private. Now, I myself don't want folks to know that I have uh, ordered up Debbie Does Dallas. I may not mind if they know that I ordered up J. Edgar, uh, but I don't want them to know that, uh, that I uh, ordered uh, Good Girls Gone Bad. And I certainly wouldn't want uh, on behalf of uh, Judge Robert Bork, I certainly wouldn't want anyone to be able to uncover the fact that he's been ordering up uh, relentlessly uh, the film Bad Boys of Summer. We have a right to privacy, and that right should not just be uh, uh, given away without adequate knowledge on behalf of the consumer what they're giving away. And so this bill has proceeded to the uh, suspension calendar with, without any kind of uh, 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 hearing uh, before the uh, Judiciary Committee on whether or not the bill should uh, be uh, marked up or not. And so we have not heard from experts. We don't know what kind of waiver uh, by internet. Uh, we don't know the mechanics of that waiver. We don't know how easy it will be to waive your right. It could be as easy as, as waiving your right uh, to a jury trial in a cell phone contract. For those reasons, I, I, I vote uh, or I ask that uh, this bill be uh, denied. And I the thank The gentleman's expired. Uh, the gentleman from Chairman. Virginia. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself uh, uh, such time as may consume. Just to say to the gentleman from Georgia that I have good news for him. Uh, there is absolutely no way that uh, anyone uh, can, under this legislation, find out uh, any of his uh, uh, video viewing habits unless he consents uh, with informed consent, with a separate consent. Uh, to allowing that information to be made known to anybody. So, uh, again, uh, this legislation makes good sense. It's what consumers want in the 21st century. It's how they share their information online. And those who don't want to share their information this way do not have to give this consent. And, uh, therefore, this legislation, I think, uh, strikes the right balance. I urge my colleagues to support the legislation and yield back the balance of my time. Bill back his time. All time has expired. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 2471? Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended and the bill is passed. Mr. Speaker. Gentleman from North Carolina. On that, I ask for a recorded vote. Gentleman asks for a recorded vote. Uh, all those... Does the gentleman ask for the yeas and nays? Ask for the yeah. yeas and nays. All those in favor of taking this vote by the yeas and nays will rise and remain standing. A sufficient number having risen, the nays, nay, yeas and nays are ordered. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, further proceedings on this question will be postponed. Mr. Speaker, I move that the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 1021, the Temporary Bankruptcy Judges Extension Act of 2011, as amended. The clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 1021, a bill to prevent the termination of the Temporary Office of Bankruptcy Judges in certain judicial districts. 
Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Smith, and the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers, each will control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days within which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous materials on H.R. 1021 as amended uh, currently under consideration. Without objection, so ordered. Gentlemen, seek recognition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may Gentlemen's assume. recognized. Mr. Speaker, one of the results of the slack economy is that more individuals and businesses have filed for bankruptcy. In fact, over the past three years, the number of bankruptcy petitions filed in bankruptcy courts has doubled. While recent data show that the volume of cases is beginning to subside, our bankruptcy judges remain hard at work. Bankruptcy judges are critical to the operation of our federal bankruptcy courts. The important bankruptcy reforms Congress passed in 2005, for example, called on judges to do more to help prevent bankruptcy abuse. And large, complex Chapter 11 cases, like the recently filed mega case of American Airlines, are time sensitive for our bankruptcy judges. In the last Congress, the Judiciary Committee reported a bankruptcy judgeships bill that would have created new permanent judgeships, converted temporary judgeships to permanent status, and extended temporary judgeships. The House passed that bill, but it did not pass the Senate. As a result, several temporary judgeships are in danger of being unable to be refilled if there is a vacancy, but the need for bankruptcy judges remains high. I introduced the legislation under consideration with the ranking member of the Court's Commercial and Administrative Law Subcommittee of the Judiciary Committee, Steve Cohen, the chairman of that subcommittee, Howard Coble, and the ranking member of the full Judiciary Committee, John Conyers. This bill permits 23 temporary bankruptcy judgeships in judicial districts throughout the country to be filled if there is a judgeship vacancy in those districts during the next five years as a result of a judge's death, removal, retirement, or resignation. Congress should ensure there are enough bankruptcy judges to handle the increased caseloads as a result of the recession. But Congress should also conserve federal resources and conduct periodic oversight of judicial caseloads. H.R. 1021 authorizes a five-year extension, which preserves Congress's ability to reassess the need for bankruptcy judges in a few years. Time is of the essence. I urge the Senate also to act quickly on this measure so that our bankruptcy system may continue to operate with speed and efficiency. I want to thank the bill's co-sponsors for their bipartisan support. Now I'll reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman time. reserves his time. The gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman's recognized. And I appreciate the uh, excellent description of the Chairman Lamar Smith uh, on 1021 the Temporary Bankruptcy Judgeships Extension Act. This is a, a very bipartisan piece of legislation extending by five years the authorizations for 30 temporary bankruptcy judges in more than 20 judicial districts around the country. Uh, I, I might point out that uh, uh, we're not adding bankruptcy judges and members of the House. That's what we ought to be doing, really, instead of just continuing the same number. Uh, we need more. Why? Uh, because uh, bankruptcy judges are, are needed more than ever. The bankruptcy filings have increased during the worst economic downturn the nation has experienced since the Great Depression. Because long-term high unemployment rates and reduced incomes have sent more people into the bankruptcy court. Because of the continuing mortgage foreclosure crisis, uh, which have affected uh, so many people, and the increasingly onerous credit card obligations and the sky-high student loans that are being collected on, and the uninsured medical debt. Last year, 1.6 million bankruptcy cases were filed, uh, representing more than 8% increase over the prior years. And so uh, two of the nation's largest automobile manufacturers in Detroit, General Motors and Chrysler, filed for bankruptcy relief uh, under uh, Chapter 11. Uh, these two cases alone involve billions of dollars of, uh, of, of, of 
substance, tens of thousands of workers, thousands of auto dealers, and thousands of creditors located in all parts of our nation. Last month, American Airlines filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy relief, and uh, national bookstore chain Borders filed uh, last month. A third factor must be kept in mind that while we maintain the status quo, more needs to be done. Bank bankruptcy courts have been performing admirably, but under critical strain. And so the bankruptcy court's workload increases, but the judicial resources are in fact diminishing. And that's why we're authorizing uh, new judicial uh, membership in the bankruptcy courts uh, in the coming year uh, if everything works out as we anticipate. Right now, though, we, we merely ask uh, the House of Representatives to uh, support the bill that I and Chairman Smith have co-sponsored, which would uh, continue the new judges uh, that are on the bench, but will not add any more. I urge your support for the additional judgeships and reserve the balance of my time. And reserves his time. The gentleman from Texas. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'll yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from Michigan. Uh, yes, uh, I would like to now yield as much time as uh, he may consume to the distinguished gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Hank Johnson. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of H.R. 1021, the Temporary Bankruptcy Judges Extension Act of 2011. Uh, sponsored by my good friend, uh, Representative Smith of Texas, uh, who is also the chair of the uh, Judiciary Committee, which I uh, am pleased to uh, serve on. And uh, I will point out how ironic it is, uh, because we are now uh, in the 336th day of this uh, reign of the Tea Party Republican Party, uh, which is uh, inalterably linked with uh, the notorious Grover Norquist and his uh, tax pledge, uh, his pledge to not raise taxes. Uh, we're getting ready, uh, Mr. Speaker, to uh, get to the end of this year, and we still. Uh, have 160 million Americans at risk uh, for suffering a massive, or I'll say a tax increase, uh, $1,000 a person on average, maybe about uh, uh, 100 and uh, I don't know how many millions of dollars that that will take out of consumers' pockets. Uh, and I don't hear Grover Norquist or the uh, Tea Party Republicans uh, crying about that. If it's, if it's the middle class, the working people, tax increase, it's okay. If it is the top 1% making over a million bucks a year, then we can't touch this. Well, I think the American people know that it's hammer time out here. It's time for uh, there to be fairness, justice and fairness for all under the law. And uh, it's ironic because we need these bankruptcy court judges' tenures to be extended as, as uh, this act would, uh, would uh, allow because there's going to be... Uh, more bankruptcies filed. Just a thousand dollars can push a uh, a person over the edge in terms of uh, 
uh, solvency is concerned. People are, are now just living paycheck to paycheck, hand to mouth, trying to determine whether or not we're going to pay the light bill or whether or not we're going to get uh, the medication that we need in order to, to, to be healthy. Uh, people are deciding whether or not to pay the, uh, the gas bill or whether or not they're going to be able to eat more than ramen noodles uh, every night for the month. And so a thousand dollars means a lot. It may not mean a lot to a millionaire, one of those top one percent that my Tea Party Republican friends uh, uh, so heartily support. But it will hurt the little man and woman and their families, especially at Christmas time. So at a time when the corporate uh, chieftains are getting their bonuses, multi-million dollar bonuses uh, based on uh, increased profits, we're still left on December the 6th. People are worried about whether or not they're going to suffer a tax uh, increase on January 1. And so let's not impose a uh, average $1,000, uh, actually $1,500. Let's not, let's not impose the threat of a $1,500 tax increase on the middle class and working people by failing to do what we should have done much earlier. There's no reason why we have not done uh, this, why we have not expanded the payroll tax cut um, that was uh, enacted last year. Let's keep that $1,500 in the pockets of uh, the average middle class family. Let's try to keep down uh, the need for people to go into bankruptcy court. Uh, let's at some point let it expire, the number of bankruptcy court judges temporarily uh, serving, and I will uh, yield back the balance of my time. General yields back. The gentleman from Michigan. I yield back. The gentleman uh, yields back his time, all time having expired. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 1021 as amended? Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. The bill is passed. And without objection, the motion reconsiders laid upon the table. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, proceedings will resume on questions previously postponed. Votes will be taken on the following order. Ordering the previous question on House Resolution 479, adopting House Resolution 479 if ordered, and suspending the rules and passing H.R. 2471. The first electronic vote will be conducted as a 15-minute vote. Remaining electronic votes will be conducted as five-minute votes. The unfinished business is the vote on ordering the previous question on House Resolution 479, on which the yeas and nays are ordered. The clerk will report the title of the resolution. House Calendar Number 95, House Resolution 479, resolution providing for consideration of the bill H.R. 10 to amend Chapter 8 of Title 5, United States Code, to provide that major rules of the executive branch shall have no force or effect unless a joint resolution of approval is enacted into law and for other purposes. Question is on ordering the previous question. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a 15-minute vote. A couple of procedural votes here in the House related to a bill that would require congressional approval of federal regulation with an annual economic cost of $100 million or more. This vote is the last chance to change the rule that sets the guidelines for debate on the bill. The change that uh, Representative Luis Water is asking for uh, would require the House to vote on passage of a bill no later than December 16th to extend the payroll tax holiday in unemployment insurance beyond 2011. That payroll tax cut expires at the end of the month. 
Politico writes that House Republicans will not vote on that plan this week to extend the jobless benefits and the tax cut, setting up a one-week showdown next week to ensure that the provisions are extended before the Christmas holiday. We spoke with a reporter for more details. Dan Friedman, a staff writer at National Journal Daily. Lawmakers on both sides of the Capitol are debating whether and how to continue a payroll tax cut that expires on December 31st. What are some of the details of the latest proposal by Senate Democrats? Senate Democrats' proposal um, is focused on, um, as you mentioned, extending the payroll tax for employees. They have dropped a um, tax break on the employer side in their latest proposal, but they continue to um, have a reduced uh, payroll tax rate, not the current 4.2% rate, but a 3.1% rate, so they've cut it further. Um, they have changed the way they pay for the bill. Um, they continue to have a surtax on incomes of more than a million dollars a year, but they, they're cutting that roughly in half, they say, and they are um, adding a means test also for millionaires or people who earn a million dollars a year to prevent them from getting some federal benefits. Um, as well as sunsetting the, um, the surtax on millionaires after 10 years, all of which they say are concessions that should help get a deal. But in reality, they, this bill will probably not be able to pass the Senate. Last week, more than half of the Republican conference voted down an alternative proposal by a Senate Republican leader, Mitch McConnell. Will there be a revised alternative from Senate Republicans this week? Republicans still seem to be considering that. I, I think they, were, they won't admit it, but they were, it was clearly a setback for, that, for leadership, Senate Republican leadership. Um, they're trying to figure out if, if, if they can get their members behind a bill. It sounds like Senator McConnell just this afternoon, on Tuesday afternoon, um, said that he was waiting for the House bill to come over. So it sounds like Republicans in the Senate have decided to set their sights on what the House is doing um, and may not be advancing an alternative proposal. They would make the point privately that the proposal that McConnell offered last week was, was sort of to provide cover for some Republicans um, who didn't want to vote against the Democratic bill last week. And it's unclear if they'll do that again. They, they did have this. So that did give people like um, Senator Scott Brown from Massachusetts or Senator Dean Heller from Nevada a chance to say, I don't support the Democratic bill, but I support this alternative that we put forward. So how much support will the proposals get, the Senate Democratic proposal and also the one from House Republicans? The Senate Democratic proposal, um, Senator Susan Collins has already voted with Democrats, so we'd expect her to do that again. They think they say they might get a few more Republicans to vote for it. Um, they, they lost um, three Democrats last time. They'll probably lose um, one or two of those at least still. So it probably still won't have um, 60 votes in the Senate. The House um, proposal, which it looks like will be rolled out on Wednesday or later this week, um, officially um, would, in addition to including payroll, would also extend unemployment benefits and, and take care of the so-called doc fix, the Medicare reimbursement formula. Um, that bill, they, they're having a lot of trouble, it sounds like, also lining up their members behind that. Um, so it sounds like arguably right now neither House may have the, the support in their chamber to actually pass their bill. House Republicans, I think, would argue they may ultimately have that. Um, so really, you know, we have to look ahead to, to the negotiation that is not happening now but will happen, presumably, between House Republican leadership and Senate Democratic leadership is the way that this will ultimately get resolved. Jan Friedman, a staff writer at National Journal Daily. Thank you. Thank you. Another issue of pending before Congress is federal spending. Uh, the National Journal writes that in order to pass an omnibus spending bill bundling the remaining nine spending bills for fiscal 2012 before December 16th, when the current temporary measure funding the government expires, Congress will have to draft a bill and get it into a joint House and Senate conference by the end of the week, likely on Thursday evening, according to aides. That in the National Journal. President Obama spoke today at a high school in Kansas. The Associated Press writes that the speech was a sweeping indictment of economic inequality in the U.S. The speech was 50 minutes long. Uh, we'll watch as much as we can during this vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Please, please have a seat. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Well, I, I want to start by thanking a few folks uh, who've joined us today. Uh, we've got the mayor of Osawatomie, Phil Dudley, is here. We have your superintendent, Gary French, 
in the house. And we have the principal of Osawatomie High, Doug Chisholm. Here. And I have brought your former governor, who is doing now an outstanding job as Secretary of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius, is in the house. We love Kathleen. Well, it is great to be back in the state of Texas, I hope, <laughs> state of Kansas. I was giving uh, Bill Self a hard time. He was here a while back. And as many of you know, uh, I have roots here. I am, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Obamas of Osawatomie. <laughs> Actually, I like to say that I got my name from my father, but I got my accent and my values from my mother. The, she was born in Wichita. Her mother grew up in Augusta. Her father was from El Dorado, so my Kansas roots run deep. And my grandparents served during World War II. Uh, he was a soldier in Patton's Army. She was a worker on a bomber assembly line. And together they shared the optimism of a nation that triumphed over the Great Depression and over fascism. They believed in an America where hard work paid off and responsibility was rewarded and anyone could make it if they tried. No matter who you were, no matter where you came from, no matter how you started out, And these values gave rise to the largest middle class and the strongest economy that the world has ever known. It was here in America that the most productive workers, the most innovative companies turned out the best products on earth. And you know what? Every American shared in that pride and in that success, from those in the executive suites to those in middle management to those on the factory floor. So you could have some confidence that if you gave it your all, you'd take enough home to raise your family and send your kids to school and have your health care covered, put a little away for retirement. And today we're still home to the world's most productive workers. We're still home to the world's most innovative companies. But for most Americans, the basic bargain that made this country great has eroded. Long before the recession hit, hard work stopped paying off for too many people. Fewer and fewer of the folks who contributed to the success of our economy actually benefited from that success. Those at the very top grew wealthier from their incomes and their investments, wealthier than ever before. But everybody else struggled with costs that were growing and paychecks that weren't. And too many families found themselves racking up more and more debt just to keep up. Now, for many years, credit cards and home equity loans papered over this harsh reality. But in 2008, the house of cards collapsed. And we all know the story by now. Mortgages sold to people who couldn't afford them or even sometimes understand them. 
banks and investors allowed to keep packaging the risk and selling it off. Huge bets and huge bonuses made with other people's money on the line. Regulators who were supposed to warn us about the dangers of all this, but look the other way or didn't have the authority to look at all. It was wrong. It combined the breathtaking greed of a few with irresponsibility all across the system. And it plunged our economy and the world into a crisis from which we're still fighting to recover. It claimed the jobs and the homes and the basic security of millions of people, innocent, hardworking Americans, who had met their responsibilities, but were still left holding the bag. And ever since, there's been a raging debate over the best way to restore growth and prosperity, restore balance, restore fairness. Throughout the country, it's sparked protests and political movements, from the Tea Party to the people who've been occupying the streets of New York and other cities. It's left Washington in a near constant state of gridlock. It's been the topic of heated and sometimes colorful discussion among the men and women running for president. <laughs> but Osawatomi, this is not just another political debate. This is the defining issue of our time. This is a make or break moment for the middle class and for all those who are fighting to get into the middle class. Because what's at stake is whether this will be a country where working people can earn enough to raise a family, build a modest savings, own a home, secure their retirement. Now in the midst of this debate, there are some who seem to be suffering from a kind of collective amnesia. After all that's happened, after the worst economic crisis, the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, they want to return to the same practices that got us into this mess. In fact, they want to go back to the same policies that stacked the deck against middle class Americans for way too many years. And their philosophy is simple. We are better off when everybody is left to fend for themselves and play by their own rules. I am here to say they are wrong. I'm here in Kansas to reaffirm my deep conviction that we're greater together than we are on our own. I believe that this country succeeds when everyone gets a fair shot, when everyone does their fair share, when everyone plays by the same rules. These aren't democratic values or Republican values. These aren't 1% values or 99% values. They're American values, and we have to reclaim them. You see, this isn't the first time America has faced this choice. At the turn of the last century, when a nation of farmers was transitioning to become the world's industrial giant, we had to decide. Would we settle for a country where most of the new railroads and factories were being controlled by a few giant monopolies that kept prices high and wages low? Would we allow our citizens and even our children to work ungodly hours in conditions that were unsafe and unsanitary? Would we restrict education to the privileged few? Because there were people who thought massive inequality and exploitation of people was 
just the price you pay for progress. Theodore Roosevelt disagreed. He was the Republican son of a wealthy family. He praised what the titans of industry had done to create jobs and grow the economy. He believed then what we know is true today, that the free market is the greatest force for economic progress in human history. It's led to a prosperity and a standard of living unmatched by the rest of the world. But Roosevelt also knew that the free market has never been a free license to take whatever you can from whomever you can. He understood that the free market only works when there are rules of the road that ensure competition is fair and open and honest. And so he busted up monopolies, forcing those companies to compete for consumers with better services and better prices. And today, they still must. He fought to make sure businesses couldn't profit by exploiting children or selling food or medicine that wasn't safe. And today, they still can't. And in 1910, Teddy Roosevelt came here to Osawatomie, and he laid out his vision for what he called a new nationalism. Our country, he said, means nothing unless it means the triumph of a real democracy, of an economic system under which each man shall be guaranteed the opportunity to show the best that there is in him. Now, for this, Roosevelt was called a radical. He was called a socialist. <laughs> Even a communist. But today, we are a richer nation and a stronger democracy because of what he fought for in his last campaign. An eight-hour workday and a minimum wage for women. Insurance for the unemployed and for the elderly and those with disabilities. Political reform and a progressive income tax. Today, over 100 years later, our economy has gone through another transformation. Over the last few decades, huge advances in technology have allowed businesses to do more with less. And it's made it easier for them to set up shop and hire workers anywhere they want in the world. And many of you know firsthand the painful disruptions this has caused for a lot of Americans. Factories where people thought they would retire suddenly picked up and went overseas, where workers were cheaper. Steel mills that needed 100 or a thousand employees are now able to do the same work with a hundred employees. So layoffs too often became permanent, not just a temporary part of the business cycle. And these changes didn't just affect blue collar workers. If you were a bank teller or a phone operator or a travel agent, you saw many in your profession replace M's and the internet. Today even Higher skilled jobs like accountants and middle management can be outsourced to countries like China or India. And if you're somebody whose job can be done cheaper by a computer or someone in another country, you don't have a lot of leverage with your employer when it comes to asking for better wages or better benefits, especially since fewer Americans today are part of a union. Now, just as there was in Teddy Roosevelt's time, there is a certain crowd in Washington who for the last few decades have said, let's respond to this economic challenge with the same old tune. 
The market will take care of everything, they tell us. If, if we just cut more regulations and cut more taxes, especially for the wealthy, our economy will grow stronger. Sure, they say, there will be winners and losers, but if the winners do really well, then jobs and prosperity will eventually trickle down to everybody else. <laughs> and, they argue, even if prosperity doesn't trickle down, well, that's the price of liberty. Now, it's a simple theory, and, and we have to admit, it, it's one that speaks to our rugged individualism and our healthy skepticism of too much government. That's, that's in America's DNA. And that theory fits well on a bumper sticker. <laughs> but here's the problem. It doesn't work. It has never worked. It didn't work when it was tried in the decade before the Great Depression. It's not what led to the incredible post-war booms of the 50s and 60s. And it didn't work when we tried it during the last decade. I mean, understand, it's not as if we haven't tried this theory. Remember in those years, in, in 2001 and 2003, Congress passed two of the most expensive tax cuts for the wealthy in history. And what did it get us? The slowest job growth in half a century. Massive deficits that have made it much harder to pay for the investments that built this country and provided the basic security that helped millions of Americans reach and stay in the middle class. Things like education and infrastructure, science and technology, Medicare and Social Security. Remember that in those same years, thanks to some of the same folks who are now running Congress, we had weak regulation, we had little oversight, and what did it get us? Insurance companies that jacked up people's premiums with impunity and denied care to patients who were sick? Mortgage lenders that tricked families into buying homes they couldn't afford? A financial sector where irresponsibility and lack of basic oversight nearly destroyed our entire economy. We simply cannot return Mr. to this Cummings brand of no. your on your own economics if we're serious Mr. about Israel. rebuilding the middle class in this country. We know that it doesn't result in a strong economy. It results in an economy that invests Mr. too Inahosa little in its people no. and in its future. Mr. Landry. We know it doesn't result in a prosperity that trickles down. It results in a prosperity that's enjoyed by fewer Mr. and Landry fewer of our citizens. I. Look at the statistics. Mr. in the last few decades, the average Mr. income of the top one percent. Mr. has Bishop gone up Utah. by more than 250 percent to 1.2 million dollars per year. Mr. Bishop of Utah I'm not talking about millionaires, people who have a million dollars. I'm saying people who make a million dollars every Cicilline. single year. For the top Cicilline one hundredth of one percent, the average income is now 27 million dollars per year. Mr. Garamendi votes no. The typical CEO who used Mr. to earn Rono. about 30 times more than his, his or her worker Mr. now Rono earns 110 no. times more. Ms. Baldwin. And yet over the last decade, the incomes Ms. of Baldwin most Americans no. have actually fallen by about 6%. Mr. Denham. Now this kind of inequality, a level that we haven't seen Mr. since Denham the Great Depression, I. Hurts us Mr. all. Carter. 
When middle class families can no longer afford to buy the goods and services that businesses are selling, when people are slipping out of the middle class, it drags down the entire economy from top to bottom. On this vote, the eighth America was built on the idea Mr. of broad based Rosco. prosperity, of strong consumers all across the country. That's why a CEO like Henry Ford made it his mission to pay his Mr. workers Rosco enough so that they could buy the cars he made. It's also why a recent this study vote, showed the that countries for 236 days or 184. The previous question is ordered. The question is on adoption of the resolution. Those in favor signify so by saying aye. Those, those opposed, no. The, in the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Mr. Speaker. Gentlelady from New York. Thank you, Mr.